you went over to London and... Sorry, I didn't talk about London at all yet. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. We're, we've got all the time in the world, but uh, you head over to London, uh, you get gold in the 200 meter individual medley in the yeah. SM11 world record time, uh, a silver in the 100 meter freestyle, a silver in the 100 meter backstroke, uh, and a bronze in the 50 meter S11 class as well. So mm. uh, tell me about the feeling of winning the gold medal. Yeah, uh, it was it was so many emotions. So I, I think I do need to mention that the, the medley race, so this is a 200 meter medley now because mm. Paralympic Games and Olympic Games raced in the 50 meter pool. And, um, and it was my last race and it was everyone else in New Zealand, like all the other New Zealand athletes across all sports had finished their competitions by the point that this race came about. So I was like the last Kiwi to be competing, which was also like quite a special feeling. Mm. Um, and it's a 10 day long competition. So I'd had four other races before this and they had all gone really well and I'd done personal best times, which is all you can hope for. And of course, like when you're a blind athlete, you can't actually see where other people are in mm. relation to you yeah so it was yeah the the athletes village is like a mini country I guess within itself and you've got um yeah people from all over the world so many languages so many like cultures kind of just being condensed into the space and then also this environment that's you know like quite high pressure and it's like it's amazing uh, and so everything like felt as if it was boiling down to this two and a half minutes or whatever it was going to be of my life that only comes around once every four years if you're lucky enough to be selected and go there mm. and I had been talking um, with Luke on the phone each day because he was in Wellington he he wasn't assigned one of the slots as a coach because we had other athletes that um that were you know ranked higher than I was so their their coaches get precedence which is which makes sense and everything mm. and um yeah so we'd been talking and he was just I remember a text from him being like you do your thing be a fish a fish and um yeah and like and take the risk which I think is um was really good advice for me because I think blind athletes but um but sometimes it might just be my personality or whatever do you you can like slightly hold back because suddenly the environment can change and you have to adapt to it but of course in a pool it's 50 meters of water exactly the same all over the world every competition same temperature mm. you know it's like everything is controlled for you which is like the opposite of life I guess so yeah um and whatever your you know whatever you get in is like nakedly visible and togs and stuff bad metaphor but um it's like it's it's so a to b mm. um and um that yeah going into that final race i was just like i really want to see how fast i can do this and um so for for swimming at um, paralympic games we've got heats in the morning and finals in the evening so the top eight times from the morning go through to the final if if you're ninth even if you know you have the fastest time in the world that year mm. boom you don't get a chance in a medal mm. if you're first in the morning um by like four seconds <laughs> or something huge then um it doesn't really matter like mm. you could get eighth in the final at night but i had gone into the um into the final ranked second so in my heats when i had done a really good really good race happy with it been told that I had broken the world record which was mm. kind of amazing and then in the next heat after me a German woman broke it by a wee bit more than me it yeah. was a record that she held um until I just nipped it and then yeah and then she um went faster again in the morning so we were going in ranked one and two um and so I was going into this race just thinking take the risk take the risk and um and like this is the final this is your final event it's only two and a half minutes of your life how how fast can you make it what can your body do um 
just thinking about one or two things so for me it was like getting out fast and strong and butterflies my strength so um just making that as fast and effortless as possible um and then really having a high stroke rate in my backstroke so those were like those were things I was thinking about I wasn't thinking about the second half of the race Mm. um and and the tapper the person that's doing the tapping and guiding me around marshalling they like you know come out to the massive stadium which just sounds like a big echoey shower with 17 and a half thousand people in London it was like so crazy wow. and big and everywhere I had some before that was a couple of hundred people maybe tops mm. um yes yeah, so it was a, a completely different physical environment and of course like internally you're just like doo-doo, 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 you know like getting up to the 120 heart rate in a minute or yeah. whatever it was supposed to be ideal before starting a race um and like slowly peeling your tracksuit off um and then they and then yeah and then the process you know like the race before you has all finished and you um so I would get guided but to the starting block mm. and you you know you set it to your ideal configuration that that suits you um and then there's a whistle that's blown and then the crowd goes like completely silent for the start of the race so everyone can hear the starter properly mm. but yeah it's seventeen and a half thousand people going wild mm. to nothing like silence and then climb onto the block and the starter says take your marks and then they press a button that makes a ah sound yeah, yeah. and so it's just like going to behind the blocks it's just like deep breaths and um and just being like, take the risk, take the risk. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I remember diving in and had no idea at the time, but um, but in that first 50 metres, the butterfly leg, touched the wall and went into the backstroke. It was like feeling, you know, feeling good and um, efficient and stuff. And yeah, had no idea that I, I had just gone under under the 50 meter butterfly world record in like the first wow. quarter of my medley, which was, um, yeah, which was really cool and crazy to read about later on. Mm. Um, and then like turning into the breaststroke leg and, you know, getting pretty tired, but like not thinking about it. And I do remember like, crashing into the lane rope a bit and thinking, no, keep going. And yeah. it's all those type of things that could have been, I could have, you know, thought, oh just hit the lane rope everyone else is probably if I was ahead they'll be catching up on me or if I was behind I'll be just getting further behind like is all it, these is outcome, it worth trying yeah you know, like but but as I, I yeah I think sometimes I am a bit risk adverse and so I, the two things from that race I was like really proud of myself for just like absolutely going for it and had worked with um you know people beforehand to to really put my mind in that state of this is your opportunity you've done all the preparation like there might be some real thoughts about you know things that could have gone better but they're not useful thoughts so yeah I just remember being in the zone before that race which is one of the like th- that time ty- those type of times in my life I could count on one hand mm. um, and then in the breaststroke leg when I you know nicked this lane rope like I didn't even consider any of the other possibilities apart from like getting straight back on track and going, yeah. And so then, and breaststroke was my weakness, and I was like, oh, just, just go, just go, Mary. Mm. Um, and yeah, I just remember turning for the last fifty meters and thinking, you know, good underwater, good underwater. Okay, how much do you actually need to breathe? It's only fifty meters. Yeah. And of course, there's. Because when you breathe in freestyle, you you know you're not you're going slightly out of your optimum position, but of course you can't travel as efficiently if you don't have any oxygen. So just trying to like re- really barrel down that last 50 meters, and and of course I have a bit of an idea of how far I am from like how many strokes I've done. Mm. But when you get really tired, you do take more strokes and if I'm not going completely straight then there's more distance so there's more strokes so there's a few factors at play and yeah I just remember putting my head down and thinking I'm not going to breathe till the end and like (laughs) where's the tapper but also just like how how can I okay this is this is the main way I can show my friends and family and Luke and all the other people who've supported me like how thankful and um 
like proud I am of them for supporting me and stuff and like like let's just do it for you know for all of us so yeah I remember the tap and like kind of smashing into the wall and we were talking a bit beforehand about like the follow-through and and swimming sometimes coaches and athletes will talk about the wall is kind of generally concrete or covered with this Mm. electronic touchpad but yeah but thinking about you don't want to be slowing down at all as you approach the wall you want to like think about that milo ad where it's obviously polystyrene or something but but the swimmer who goes right through the wall and um and yeah so just like really every millisecond counts just want to be on exactly the right angle with your arm completely outstretched so yeah i just remember such a mixture of emotions like it's over i'm shattered um and wow it's it really is a team effort to to get me to that point mm. yeah and of course i had no idea my time uh the place had come anything like the crowd was going crazy and and especially when you're swimming breaststroke your head is coming up and down out of the water and you can kind of hear like Hoo! silence Hoo! Yeah. yeah silence or in london it was the first time i remember in a non-breaststroke race, being able to hear the crowd because it was like a wall of noise supporting you or supporting mm. any of the swimmers. But yeah, um, there was some kind of loudspeaker happening, but I couldn't hear them because the crowd was too loud. Um, and your tapper isn't... I wonder if they've changed the rules in these 18 months since I've stopped racing, but um, at that time, you weren't supposed to tell your athlete what place they'd come because the results aren't technically official. Um which is really sad because sighted swimmers get to like spin around and look at the electronic mm. scoreboard and, and you know, there might be changes to their results if someone gets disqualified or whatever. Um, but for us, yeah, there's, I think I've described them as like microwave, <laughs> microwave minutes before where it's probably only two minutes. Yeah. But for you to hear the results, it feels like so long. Mm. Um, and I do remember in that race hearing one person finish after me and I was like I didn't come last <laughs> it's really good yeah um, and when everyone's finished there's a double whistle and everyone gets out of the pool from the side that's closest to them the officials check your goggles again to check that they're completely black and you can be disqualified if you know you've got a scratch and there's light coming through and stuff um that's never happened to me thankfully mm. I have had a friend who um, was another Kiwi blind swimmer and uh I think maybe her racing goggles snapped and marshalling and she was having to wear her training ones or something like that. But the goggles she wore in the race, she didn't know cause she can't see. But, um, but when they got checked after the race, they, um, the paint or whatever she'd used to black them out had like peeled in a place and, and she got disqualified, which is really harsh, especially if you've had like a brilliant race and you haven't you know, been able to notice it, but that's, that's just like the rules. So yeah, your goggles get checked and, um, and then my guide, Tapper, uh, when, when all of our goggles have been checked, she just like grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me a bit. And I just remember her saying, Mary, you got first, you broke the world record, like mm. it's gold. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a life highlight forever. Like there's, yeah, there's just nothing to prepare you or that you can compare that that type of moment with because um, it's, yeah, it was a culmination of like 19 years of this merry individual's life but the hundreds of people in Upper Hutt who had, you know, like helped me out with getting to certain competitions as a kid and teenager and then um, just, you know, the, the system and the people who had allowed me to, to train and be in that place to try and take the risk and then that outcome to happen. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's really crazy to think about looking back on it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful memory and I love the way that you describe it all. Yeah, yeah have it, you had games that feel like that? Because, because something's such a like one thing Mm. that I imagine cricket's like a bit different yeah surely after some matches when everything has just kind of gone right 
Have you had that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I recently, um, fortunate enough in a, in a T20 final, mm. um, it was just one of those games where everything just went my way. Um, and I wanted to be there. I wanted to play. Uh, I knew exactly what I was wanting to, how I wanted to perform. And it was definitely a, a day where I was in the zone and in flow and, um, it, it was weirdly at the time I kind of could recognize it as well. I was like, man, like this is, everything's just happening. Mm. But then I, I didn't want to jinx it as well. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, no, 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 keep concentrating on what you're doing. But it's, um, yeah, it, it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, but it's, I love what you said uh, before when you were training where you said uh, not every day that you are 100% but you've just got to give you a hundred percent effort in that moment. Yeah. Uh, for and the vast majority of days, you're not going to no. feel a hundred percent. Exactly. But, yeah. Exactly. It's, um, yeah, but it's just the way that you have got that memory of that, that one race. And, um, mm. it's so cool. And, uh, and I'm sure it's a, a wonderful memory you can look back on and, um, even just hearing the crowd and yeah. I'm sure that hearing the national anthem after getting your gold medal and, um, you know, it, it's just a, a, a something that you dream of, uh, and to be nineteen to achieve that is yeah. is amazing, amazing. It's uh, really funny when people say, "What was it like on the podium and hearing the national anthem?" And it's like such a blur that I don't really remember it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Um. So you've 